major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit billhowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. by viewers like you. Thank you. It's arguably the biggest problem faced by local governments across California, homelessness. Thanks for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. A major way both the city and the county of San Diego work to solve the issue is by following an approach called Housing First. But as KPBS reporter John Carroll tells us, some local leaders say Housing First is just making the problem worse. The numbers are not what anyone wants to see. Data from both the city of San Diego and the county show rising numbers month after month of people on the streets and in shelters. Even though Housing First works for some, it's not the, t it's not the panacea that everyone expects it to be. County Supervisor Jim Desmond and a handful of other local elected officials summoned the media to the county complex in Kearney Mesa today to say Housing First, a program, simply put, that prioritizes getting people off the streets and into housing, is not the way to go. They've got to deal with the demon of drug and alcohol abuse in their lives. And until they do that, they're not going to progress. That is the crux of the complaint against Housing First, that the program is, yes, getting people into housing, but not mandating that they deal with problems suffered by many homeless people, substance abuse, and mental health challenges. You ask any cop, any firefighter, any paramedic, any ER doc, they will tell you that homelessness is almost entirely due to drug and alcohol abuse. Standing in the crowd today with us in the media were two people with a very different take on the situation. Representatives from PATH, people assisting the homeless, and the San Diego Housing Commission. Almost everything was wrong with what we heard here today. Ryan Klumpner is vice chair of the San Diego Housing Commission. He says what the opponents of housing first say is all political. These were not statements based on facts, statistics, best practices. Klumpner agrees it's important for those struggling with addictions to get help. But he says opponents of Housing First are basically putting the cart before the horse. Housing First um, is a concept that basically says that uh, somebody will not resolve their mental health or their substance use if they are required to do so while they are not housed, while they are on the street. That's it. Tyler Renner with PATH, People Assisting the Homeless, says people helped by Housing First have access to services to help with addiction. They have on-site support, case management, and they have connections to health care. They have connections to uh, substance use treatment if they want. I think what's really missing from the conversation is where's the funding for said programs. So many questions, ideas, different approaches to solving a problem that can sometimes seem intractable. John Carroll, KPBS News. President Biden is touting a job well done, but says more work is needed after Congress passed a debt ceiling compromise. A minutes ago, he gave his first presidential address from the Oval Office, and he commended the bipartisan efforts by those involved in the deal, including House Speaker Kevin McCarthy. The president also spoke about his budget priorities, which included not cutting funding for programs like Medicare and Social Security, and generating new revenue by going after tax evaders. The president says he is going to sign the deal into law tomorrow. The May jobs report released today shows the labor market isn't ready to slow down just yet. Ivan Rodriguez reports on what this means for the economy and for the Federal Reserve going into its next meeting. The latest jobs report shattering expectations. In May, employers added 339,000 jobs, way above the 190,000 economists had expected. In a statement, President Joe Biden says today is a good day for the American economy and American workers. 
Chief economist for ADP Neil Richardson says the labor market is strong but extremely fragmented. Manufacturing actually shed jobs in our private sector report. Leisure and hospitality again a big gainer. Two, that this strength is really driven by small firms. Large firms seem to be pulling back on their hiring. And three, we're finally seeing pay growth decelerate meaningfully. Although the average jobs numbers so far this year are below 2022 levels, the May gains remain elevated from pre-pandemic times where 163,000 jobs were added per month in 2019. The unemployment rate also ticked up to 3.7 percent from 3.4 percent. There's still pockets where P, uh, firms are struggling to find qualified talent. At 3.4 percent, that means there's not a lot of give in the, in the labor market. There's a, not a lot of people just sitting on the sidelines waiting to be scooped up. As it continues monitoring the labor market, the Federal Reserve will meet later this month to consider whether to raise interest rates for an 11th consecutive time. Richardson says her hope is for hiring not to be impacted even if those rates keep rising. That is the definition of a soft landing in my eyes, is that the, the labor market stays strong even with higher interest rates. I'm Ivan Rodriguez reporting. Black San Diegans are far more likely to be stopped for biking and walking infractions, according to police data. KPBS reporter Katie Heisen has more. Black people in San Diego are four times more likely than white people to be stopped for things like not having a bike light and jaywalking. And black and Latino residents are more likely to receive harsher treatment after being stopped, like being handcuffed or searched. That's according to data from the San Diego Police Department. The department did not respond to requests for comment. Will Radigan, former advocacy director for the San Diego County Bicycle Coalition, wrote a report on these disparities. He says these minor offenses can highlight discrimination. This is where officers have the most discretion on who they stop and who they don't. They might see 10 people jaywalk in a day. They choose to stop one person. Who is that person? If that person is black four times as often, that really indicates you have a racial bias issue. But he says it's also an infrastructure issue. Generally wealthier, wider police beats north of the eight have lower bike and pedestrian stop rates. The highest stop rates are clustered in neighborhoods in southeast San Diego and City Heights. They'll have incomplete sidewalks. They won't have bike lanes. The bike lanes will be full of debris. And when the infrastructure isn't set up so that you're able to follow the law, you're forced to break it. A new state law says police can't stop pedestrians for offenses that aren't dangerous to another person. But it doesn't extend to cyclists. Have you been stopped for a biking or walking infraction in San Diego? KPBS wants to hear from you. Visit our site for more on this story and to share your experience. Katie Heisen, KPBS News. After a year-long closure, Lake Hodges Dam in San Diego's North County is open again, just in time for summer. But as KPBS reporter Jacob Ayer explains, there are plans to close it for good and build a new dam nearby. Lake Hodges Dam is old, over 100 years old in fact. Since it opened in 1918, it's had some wear and tear over the years and needed some critical repair work to keep it up and running. Now it's been reopened to the community. It opened yesterday and will remain open through October. We're open for recreation on Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, sunrise to sunset. So what can you actually do there? Drew Kleiss with the San Diego Public Utilities Department gives us some ideas. Kayaking, canoeing, shore fishing. Uh, we do have rental boat fishing and float tin fishing, uh, in addition to fishing uh, along the shore. And there's great hiking opportunities, so we're excited that that is back open again. The city-owned Hodges Reservoir is primarily meant to impound water for drinking water purposes and serves tens of thousands of San Diegans every month. This year alone, we moved over 6,000 acre feet of water to our uh, water supply systems. That's water that, uh, free water that we recover from the rainfall. The water level was lowered for planned maintenance work in May 2022, which revealed new cracks and defects that extended the dam repairs into a year-long process. But even with those most recent fixes, the current dam doesn't have an infinite shelf life. The city's initiated the design of a new roller compacted concrete dam. We anticipate being able to complete construction in 2034. 
As for current recreation at Lake Hodges, private boat launching and water contact activities like paddleboarding and windsurfing are unavailable due to the low water levels and quality of the water. The lake is closed on the third Wednesday of every month. Jacob Ayer, KPBS News. A stern warning from Governor Gavin Newsom and other state officials to school administrators. Do not follow red state's leads when it comes to banning books. A letter issued by the governor, the state attorney general and state superintendent reads in part, access to books that may challenge us to grapple with uncomfortable truths is a profound freedom we all must protect and cultivate. I feel that is something that I should tell my kids, not the school, not the teachers. I, I watch the words that I tell my kids. I don't know how they're going to tell my kids. We know what happens when you dilute education for children. They become uneducated adults. In Newsom's letter, he cites more than 1,400 book bans across the country as one of the reasons for his warning to district districts not to put limits on issues that can be taught. More and more kids are experiencing significant mental health challenges. For one San Diego teen, a residential treatment program was life-changing, but that option hasn't been available to some of the most vulnerable children. KPBS health reporter Matt Hoffman says that's about to change. And a warning to viewers, this story includes a mention of self-harm. Fifteen-year-old Maddie Harvey's love of music started when her grandpa bought her a ukulele a few years ago. A year or two later, I saved up the money to buy my acoustic guitar, and I started learning that. That was a lot harder. Maddie enjoys jam sessions with her friends from the Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps at San Marcos High School. Ready, set, up, run. It's there that Maddie has found her tribe. I joined JROTC and that like the first day I went into my flight, I was like, okay, yeah, these are gonna be my people. Uh Bye. Maddie has done well in the program, and her instructor, Mark McLeod, says she's set to take on a leadership role with the class next year. She comes in with energy. She puts her um, drive into it. She doesn't take no for an answer. Three, two, one. The road to get here hasn't been easy. Maddie struggled with her mental health over the years. Her parents, Cindy and Steve Harvey, found out she had a sensory processing disorder at five years old. You know, she'd get so upset at a teacher, you know, for example, wearing high heels, that clicking sound would drive her, you know, crazy and she'd, you know, have to be excused from class and then she'd be outside beating her head off a brick wall trying to, you know, create any other sound besides yeah. those you know, high heels on the floor. So that, I mean, it, and that was really kind of at the worst of it. A CDC report from earlier this year says mental health among students is getting worse. In 2021, 22% of high school students reported considering suicide and about 40% reported persistent sadness. Maddie's parents first sent her to a residential treatment center when she was in fourth grade. She ended up going three different times. We were really worried about the self-harm issues and a few trips to the hospital too. Was, and that's when we're like, okay, we need more care. That was tough. I mean, as a parent, you don't want to, you know, like give your child to anybody else to, to care for. But again, we were just, we did not have the tools necessary to, you know, to get her to where she is right now. Residential treatment is a higher level of care that sees kids staying for days, weeks, or even months at a time. At the San Diego Center for Children, it involves everything from psychiatry to counseling and therapeutic activities. CEO Moises Baron says it's a key part of care, especially for kids who may be going to the emergency room for mental health reasons. We know that when we can provide the appropriate level of care, we're able to respond, pr provide what the youth and the family needs and hopefully prevent this kind of revolving door from continuing or a problem that could be addressed becoming more serious. Baran says there's a gap in the system. While residential treatment is available for kids who have private insurance, referrals from schools are in the foster system, on probation, and those with welfare services, it's not available for kids who have Medi-Cal. That's the state's health plan largely serving low-income residents. If the child is in the hospital or in the emergency department and the staff knows that this kid needs a higher level of care, but they have Medi-Cal, 
that's not an option. That's not an option, and that's what needs to change. What's changing that is a result of Assembly Bill 2317. It was signed into law last year, and it creates a new license category that will allow psychiatric residential treatment facilities to serve everyone, including kids with Medi-Cal. We have story after story after story of success, and families that tell us, if it hadn't been for this level of care, I don't know what would have happened to my child. We want families with Medi-Cal to be able to tell the same stories. Maddie's most recent time in residential treatment was a seventh-month stay at the San Diego Center for Children. She says there, everything turned around. I understood why this time it was the self-harm thing and I needed to get more serious help because what was happening wasn't going to work. And then I met some really great counselors and staff and that also deal with the same things that I deal with and have similar stories as me and we clicked immediately. Maddie's parents say the residential treatment has been life-changing. That's just it though. I mean, without the insurance that we had um, or have the time, like, there's no way. No. I mean, she would have been in and out of hospitals every other weekend probably. Now since she's out of the center, she has a good head on her shoulders and has her coping skills, it's it's more fun and relaxed now yeah. than what it was. It's not as eggshells. It's nice. The future is bright for Maddie. At 15, she's looking forward to getting her first job soon and getting behind the wheel. I can get my permit in October, and I am so excited. Maddie says when she grows up, she wants a job that can help people. She isn't ruling out one day working at a place like the San Diego Center for Children. Knowing that I've been there and knowing how much uh, the center has helped people, and I know the center will still be running by the time I'm an adult. Considering how much they've helped me and other kids, I know it'll still be running. sound right now? Yeah. Oh, we don't get the sound right now. Matt Hoffman, KPBS News. If you or someone you know is struggling with thoughts of suicide, you can call the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline at 988 for support, information, and for resources. It sounds like science fiction, but the Defense Department says it's tracking more than 800 cases of unidentified phenomenon. They're known as UAPs, or more commonly UFOs. As Mike Valeria reports, a team from NASA will publish its first report on them next month. Oh my God, dude. A team of independent experts assembled by NASA to study unidentified anomalous phenomenon, or UAPs, held their first public meeting this week. The presence of UAPs raises concerns about the safety of our skies. Among the struggles they're facing when it comes to identifying UFOs, low quality data. The current data collection efforts regarding UAPs are unsystematic and fragmented across various agencies. The Pentagon's Sean Kirkpatrick told the panel his office is looking into more than 800 reports of UAPs received over three decades, but says only two to five percent of those cases can really be considered unexplained. While a large number of cases in Arrow's holdings remain technically unresolved, this is primarily due to a lack of data. So could any of these sightings offer proof there's life beyond the stars? The answer is no. Astrophysicist Adam Frank is pretty skeptical. There's nothing that even comes close to the standards of evidence that we would need. The University of Rochester professor isn't associated with the NASA team. He thinks the increase in reports of UAPs is related to government transparency and science. When you look at the history of UFO reports in the government, clearly during the Cold War, you know, the, the military had an agenda, you know, because uh, we were dealing with the Russians and disinformation was great. And so I think now finally a true open scientific investigation of what's happening. I'm Mike Valerio reporting. Our June gloom continues through the weekend and it just gets a little bit worse into next week. So clouds will hang tough right near the coast, the inland valleys. We will see some sunshine in the afternoon hours and that's where we'll see a little bit of warming into the weekend here. Mountain storms could be possible early next week and maybe a few showers dancing about as uh, another upper low approaches the area with more cooling. For tonight, clouds thickening up. 
Temperatures dropping down to 59 in the metro. Temperatures uh, dropping to 57 Oceanside, Chula Vista 58, uh, Mount Laguna at 53, and Campo at 47. Here's the way it looks on the, the future cast. Uh, we have some low clouds uh, tickling the coast. During the overnight hours, extending into the inland valleys, and the inland valleys will see some sun uh, during the day tomorrow, but near the coast, uh, any sunshine limited. As we look at the forecast for you, temperatures will stay in the 60s, closer to the coast, inland valleys into the low and mid-70s. Brago Springs hits 99, and Campo's up to 75. As we go to the upper air chart, well, fall the lines here, and... We'll see them all coming together with another upper low spinning into the area early next week. So we'll see more clouds, more cooling as we go to the extended forecast. Maybe a stray shower or two as well. Inland areas, some sun and a little bit milder before we start to see more clouds and cooler into early next week with a spotty shower. Heading up into the mountains, uh, still a little bit breezy at times, uh, some sun and then turning much cooler with that next upper low. And in the deserts, uh, we'll see some nice warm weather here with sunshine. And then with that next upper low, temperatures not as warm early next week. And for KPBS News, I'm meteorologist Mark Mancuso. Another solid jobs report is giving the Fed more to think about. It's trying to find a balance between economic growth, inflation, and interest rates. SDSU's Mayor Kopik gives us some context in the Friday business report. The job market is extraordinarily resilient and very, very dynamic. This was 78% higher than the than the consensus estimate of about 190,000 jobs. 29 straight months of employment increases since January of 2021, over 13 million new jobs have been created in the U.S. economy. So this, you know, it's very hard for the Fed to kind of balance this off because uh, they're not seeing the interest rate hikes that they've had really impacting the job market. But so the Fed is going to, you know, after today's jobs report, the odds that they might actually increase their rate in June increase somewhat. My bet is that the Fed will still pause for June because they need to let the economy catch up and the different sectors catch up. Wages were up 4.3%. That's decelerating uh, when wages were up on an average of five to five and a half percent during most of 2022. But, you know, we're, we're going to see because this labor report was very, very strong. Pride Month festivities will officially be underway this weekend as thousands of people will head to the beach to celebrate. Oceanside Pride by the Beach kicks off tomorrow at noon near the Civic Center. It's the first big festival marking Pride Month in our county. It features a number of booths run by local businesses and stages set for live entertainment. While Pride is only one day of celebration, is the day or the month where people really find the courage to normalize their own um, identity to come out to their parents, to come out to their friends, or to find courage to just be authentic to themselves and, and be surrounded by people that are loving, supporting. If you're planning to attend, per Pier View Way will be closed off between North Coast Highway and Dittmar Street for the event, and there is no entrance fee, and the festival runs from 12 to 6. Looking to catch a movie this weekend? KPBS cinema junkie Beth Accomando has a couple of recommendations, starting with Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. It's the eagerly awaited sequel to the 2018 animated hit Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> Miles Morales. I'm Brooklyn's one and only Spider-Man. Ever since Miles Morales swung into cinemas, he's been my favorite Marvel screen character. Everyone keeps telling me how my story is supposed to go. Nah, I'm gonna do my own thing. And that's what Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse does, its own thing. While the story is rooted in the comics, the film serves up an audacious narrative style brimming with action, humor, and heartfelt emotion. Miles, being Spider-Man is a sacrifice. The animation is breathtaking. It's innovative and cinematic, but also deeply indebted to the comic book form. It reflects the personality of each Spidey and each dimension. And then the styles collide, explode, and merge into each other in spectacular ways. Can't stop me now. But I just have one complaint. 
the cliffhanger ending. I was not expecting that, and there's something frustrating about the lack of resolution. But the third film is supposedly coming out early next year, and since Miles has yet to disappoint me, I'll just try to be patient. If you want to animate your weekend, then just go see Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. It's beyond amazing. But if you're looking for something a little weirder, then I recommend the truly insane Larry Cohen film, God Told Me To, presented by Bonkers Ass Cinema this Saturday night at 10 p.m. at Digital Gym Cinema. I could tell you what happens in this film, but you'd still be surprised and shocked by how it all unravels on screen. Are you going to tell me all those people are meant to die? I'll be there to co-present with Film Geek San Diego, and we'll be screening the new 4K restoration of this 1976 Cohen cult classic. And finally, there's a new adaptation of Stephen King's short story, The Boogeyman. The story is about a monster that hides in closets and under beds to terrorize kids and their families. The film taps into horror fundamentals and takes the horror seriously. It mercifully does not hide behind a scream-style meta-jokiness, and it delivers a cool, scary monster. It's the thing that comes for your kids when you're not paying attention. But here's what I hate. How stupid the characters are. Sweetheart, let me handle it. I just don't understand why so many horror films are too lazy to go over their scripts and address those groan moments when characters behave in such a dumb manner that it pulls you right out of the film. It's just frustrating when a film has some solid craftsmanship and promising elements, but just can't take the time to fine-tune its script. But if you're craving horror on the big screen this weekend, then The Boogeyman does provide intermittent fun. Beth Accomando, KPBS News. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Maya Trabulsi. Good night. Major funding for KPBS Evening Edition has been made possible in part by Bill Howe Family of Companies, providing San Diego with plumbing, heating and air, restoration, flood and remodeling services for over 40 years. Call 1-800-BILL-HOWE or visit BillHowe.com. And by the Conrad Prebis Foundation, Darlene Marco Shiley, and by the following. And by viewers like you. Thank you.